वेलकम टू मेडिका कार्डियो टॉक सिक्सटीन सो मी डॉक्टर रॉबिन चक्रवर्ती विद मी माई कलिग डॉक्टर दिलीप कुमार आर डिस्कसिंग टूडे अबाउट द न्यू आर गाइडलाइन ऑफ हार्ट फेल्यूर मैनेजमेंट वी नो दैट ग्लोबली द पेशेंट्स नंबर एंड वॉल्यूम इज प्रोग्रेसिवली इंक्रीजिंग सो फॉर द हार्ट फेल्यूर इज कंसर्न बट द प्रॉब्लम रिमेन्स इज how to manage these heart failure patient because the number is so huge and there are different stages of the natural history of heart failure so american heart association therefore uh, created a new guideline in 2022 and let us know from dr dilip kumar that what are the new guideline of heart failure management as suggested by american heart association in 2022 dr dilip kumar please so thank you sir and uh, hello everyone so in fact uh, this is a very interesting time and exciting time in fact for all the heart failure treating physicians and cardiologists and we have come a long way uh, in last one decade uh, we have uh, moved from handful of options to plenty of options now and this aha 2 2022 guidelines on heart failure has given us real important breakthroughs so uh, to start with uh, let me enumerate the number one uh, breakthrough which we got is uh, sgl2 inhibitors have been given first time a place in any guidelines in the management of heart failure right so it is given class 2 indication uh, for patients who have a heart failure with mildly reduced risk reaction and patients with hfpf heart failure with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so uh, previously we did not have any any drug which were there in guideline in the management of hfpf now we have uh, agl2 inhibitors as class 2a and rni and mras as class 2b indication so rni has gone down to 2b whereas sglt2 inhibitors like empagliflozin and dapagliflozin they have come up uh, in the guideline in 2a heart failure patients right yes, yes. so if you could tell us a little bit more and why there is so importance of sglt2 inhibitor in heart failure patients so we did not have any such precedence that a particular uh, drug with two you know uh, kind of sister you know drugs like empa and dapa having uh, five large trials and all becoming positive trials for in heart failure so it is it is it is just unimaginable right you did mention that sglt2 inhibitor like dapagliflozin empagliflozin are 2a indications whereas rni is 2b indication so why rni is is 2b indication is there any guideline or is there any sort of scientific trial to suggest that to be uh, should be a rni so rni has been given class uh, 2b indication uh, we had a trial called uh, paragon heart failure trial it's not a new trial it came uh, roughly yeah. around 2 years back 2 years so 2 and two years more back. actually and then it narrowly missed the significance so it was uh, numerically there was a benefit you know but it didn't reach significance but with this trial Uh, the fda recommended first uh, the use of uh, rni in class uh, in, you know hfpf patients and then finally we have got class 2 b indication for rni so and but in uh, heart failure with reduced section fraction hfpf rni is class 1 and um, uh, all symptomatic patients probably should receive rni but in hfpf patients in mildly reduced section fraction the aglt inhibitors uh, should precede Uh, and the only drug which is recommended which is excellent so we need to understand that heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so obviously sglt2 inhibitor is of paramount importance in mildly reduced ejection fraction and of course in other patients of heart failure similarly rni again is of importance in heart failure patients which are aware which are important so physician need to be aware that importance of heart failure management rni and sgl2 inhibitor play an important role uh, now i would also like to know from you uh, dr kumar that uh, these patients of heart failure who are on sgl2 inhibitor are they all diabetic or even in non diabetic group of patient also sglt2 inhibitor has to be prescribed so when we talk about heart failure patients so irrespective of their diabetic status we talk about so uh, this is regardless of their diabetic status and uh, we were talking about some uh, you know uh, hindsight and important breakthroughs from aha 2022 guidelines so there are two you know important other factors which i we noticed the first one, the, uh, the, the 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 another one which i would like to highlight is the oversimplified rather the uh, definition of 
heart failure with improved ejection fraction. Right. So, what is that? What is the oversimplification? What exactly so, you mean by that? So, previously uh, there was a definition uh, where there was a, if someone has ejection fraction uh, improved beyond 40 percent, somewhere like 35 percent now it has gone more than 40 percent, this is an improved ejection fraction. Or if the patient had a more than 10 units increase in ejection fraction. So, someone who had a 25 percent EF, now he has 35 percent EF. Now we consider them, we used to consider them as uh, yeah, that was the one. improved ejection fraction. And what is the what is the current sort of current all across? If the patient has ejection fraction now moved more than forty percent, we say that is improved ejection fraction. So irrespective of the patient had a thirty eight percent or thirty five percent, twenty five percent. But you don't think that that could be uh, meaningless because somebody ejection fraction let us say twenty four percent and forty percent of that is uh, how much two and plus two say uh, around eight percent. So uh, and you can't really compare. Of there is each baseline ejection fraction could, could be so much variable. variable. And if you put a given figure like 40 percent, how practical it is or what is the relevance of such 40 percent? Yeah, I think uh, th that is the, uh, you know, query everyone is feeling and uh, is kind of, uh, you know, raising uh, the concerns. But basically, I think essentially it has uh, come up uh, in the light that ejection fraction is basically we are moving away from ejection fraction. Mm. So there can be so much of variation. That's what the point put a point a single figure rather than uh, someone 28, 29, 30, 35, something like that. Right. But definitely there is a point of concern. Someone has a 15% EF. He has to go long way to be labeled as ejection fraction improved. But he has improved his, if ejection fraction has come to 35% from 15. Oh. Now, if I ask you to just very quickly summarize uh, with some important bullet points about the newer guideline of American Heart Association in 2022. What are those, let us say, five or ten important points, Dr. Kumar? So, uh, so I will not go to five to ten because essentially it is more or less same. But these three are very important. First, the incorporation of SGL2 inhibitors in class 2A in mildly reduced ejection fraction and HFPEP. Second was they have more, more and more emphasized on importance of prevention. So, stage A heart failure where there is only risk factor. Now they are they are labeling it as heart failure at risk patients. Ah, so that means this, this is, is very important. Who is eventually getting to heart failure at some stage, if not being at risk yeah. right now? Yeah. Say so substrate, which is eventually going to heart yeah. failure. And second stage B, they have labeled as pre -heart, pre heart failure status. So mm -hmm. these are they they have come in a strong ways. So heart failure awareness and treatment should start very early and prevention preventive strategies. Yes. And third was what we discussed. Uh, so to, to to make it very simple, catch them young, catch them early. So that you can intervene early pharmacologically with the uh, management of the substrate of heart failure, be it hypertension, be it diabetes and hypertension, ischemic heart disease, or even other cardiovascular condition, which eventually take the patient towards heart failure. And once the patient goes into heart failure, you find out that who is which patient is at risk, and accordingly you treat, and then you decide that patient should need SGLT2 inhibitor or RNE depending upon the clinical status of the patients in heart failure. But finally, before we, we, we close the talk on heart failure, what are your thoughts about the so-called sodium restriction or salt restriction in heart failure patients? What is the sort of benefit in terms of mortality so, in patients of heart failure? So it's a very, very important point. And every time uh, we physicians and, there was, uh, and dietitians, they used to very strictly tell patients not to take sodium. Right. A very strict restriction of sodium intake and that was and that had no uh, kind of uh, evidence. Without evidence we were telling that and that's why a trial uh, was done, sodium uh, heart failure trial and, and, and the results were really remarkable. They did and not find any difference in the mortality and the clinical endpoints. True. The only benefit was the patient's quality of life and that too was very subjective. So, that so which is very important for the physician and all the listener to understand that too much of salt restriction, too much of sodium restriction may not have extra benefit for the patients of heart failure. So now coming uh, from heart failure, let us just quickly uh, take a couple of minutes to discuss about the physiological hemostasis and pathological thrombosis and what is this coupling means and what is uncoupling of this. So there's a new concept coming up between physiological hemostasis and pharmacological thrombosis. Again, Dr. Kumar, if you could tell us about this the difference between physiological hemostasis and pathological thrombosis and what is this coupling and uncoupling of these two and what are the new drug or new concept of this uh, this, this this clot management or clot uh, pathophysiology yes. understanding. Yeah. I think yes sir and very very valid point and 
uh, in last 60 years rather when the first anticoagulant came uh, we have a very long journey remarkable journey rather so the initial drugs uh, warfarin uh, we had uh, you know reduced thrombosis but there was more bleeding bleeding exactly. and then came doax where the thrombosis was uh, more or less same or less even but bleeding was significantly less right. Was uh, sorry, but, low, sorry, yeah, low, low. But yes. even then it was there, yes. reading was there. Yes. So uh, there was a kind of a quest for holy grail where we can reduce thrombosis but the bleeding should not happen. Correct. And and there uh, we are moving and the targets are uh, basically factor 11a. Why factor 11a? Why not factor 2 or factor 10? So we, we know that the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway and the common pathway where we are targets like 2 and factor 10, they are exactly. the common pathway. Right. So whenever we are blocking it, we are also, you know, uh, empowering making the patient prone for bleeding. Right, exactly. But if we uncouple this uh, pathological thrombotic part and the physiological hemostasis by targeting factor 11a, which is not com you know, in the uh, involved in the common pathway, we can uncouple this. And that's why uh, this drug uh, is getting a lot of, uh, you know, This is the drug called as as Ascendexian. Ascendexian. And uh, we have got a trial called Pacific 2 trial, which, is which was uh, presented in the ACCHA 2020, uh, two, three, three, three weeks back. And this is very remarkable. So, ascendexian drug, what benefit is it has shown? This is the drug which actually showed that uncoupling. Yes. And then uh, it should, this is a factor 11 inhibitor. And uh, th uh, it was compared against Apixaban. Oh, right. Okay. And they have found 50% redu reduced bleeding. So, this is really a uh, very but remarkable. But what about pathological thrombosis? And thrombo thrombosis part was almost same. Right. And, and, and basically the efficacy is being... Now it will be looked up. Look, you know, in the uh, next phase three trials, it will be seen. It was basically a safety trial, phase two trial. Excellent. So it looks like that the newer understanding of factor 11A's role uh, in, un, in in the mechanism of physiological hemostasis and pathological thrombosis. So if you could sort of uncouple these two different mechanisms by a uh, factor 11A inhibitor like ascendexian, patient may get benefit in terms of not having thrombosis, but at the same time not having any extra bleeding. With that note, we uh, conclude today and hope you to see you soon with Medica Cardio Talk 17. Thank you very much. Thank you.